Uh, go ahead and open to Romans chapter 6. I'm going to read the first 14 verses in Romans chapter 6. Um, the sermon's on baptism, so it's actually today is not particularly on one passage of Scripture, even though that's how we usually preach, but we are looking at baptism today. Um, it's a shorter sermon than usual. Go ahead and turn to Romans 6. I'm going to go ahead and read Romans 6, uh, 1 through 14. And it reads, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Or do you not know that as many of us were baptized into Christ Jesus, were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him through baptism into death. That just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in the newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin. Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all, but that life that he gives, he he lives to God. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead dead indeed to sin, but 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 alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey in it its lust. And do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. Let's pray. Lord, we are so thankful that that when we were dead in our sins and trespasses, you made us alive. And Lord, as we come together today to worship you, Lord, we want to celebrate in baptism for some of these people to tell the world that you made them alive, not through baptism, but through faith, grace through faith in your son that you sent, the perfect sacrifice. The one-time sacrifice, the Lamb of God you sent, And Lord, as we come before you today, uh, we pray, Lord, that you would be glorified, um, that that you would be honored in the testimonies that are about to be given at the end of the service. And also pray, Lord, that you would be glorified in the preaching of your word, that you would hide your servant behind the cross, and that we would understand baptism, the importance of it, and that Jesus commanded it, Lord, and he commanded it because it shows our identity in you, and it shows that we love you and we want to honor you. And Lord, I know that these three people that will be baptized today, they want, to, they want to show the world that they love you and that they're part of your family and that you've adopted them. Lord, I pray that you would bless our time together, uh, bless the preaching, bless the testimonies, bless the baptism, bless our fellowship afterwards as we eat, and we praise you in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Go ahead and be seated. So um, I label this sermon, uh, The Importance of Being Baptized, and I just kind of wanted to walk through the Bible a little bit uh, on baptism, and, and the place that I would think we should go first is where our Lord um, was baptized. And so um, today, your verses are on the screen. Um, because we're looking at various verses. But um, what I want you to do is turn over to Matthew chapter 3, and we see that Jesus' ministry begins with baptism. As as you guys know, um, Jesus was on earth about 30 years before he began his ministry, right? He was grown up mostly in Galilee, in the town of Nazareth. And when he got older and he begins his ministry, we see that his ministry began with baptism. Uh, Matthew chapter 3. Um, and we also know that there was a man that was a herald, uh, 
A herald was somebody who went before the king and told people the king was coming. And that herald was John the Baptist, and he was a prophet that was to proclaim that Christ was coming. And so what we see is John the Baptist has this ministry where he is proclaiming Christ is coming, and then Christ comes to him to be baptized, okay? So let's go ahead and read Matthew three thirteen through 17. Then Jesus came from Galilee, that's the northern part of Israel, to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. And John tried to prevent him, saying, I need to be baptized by you. And are you coming to me? But Jesus answered and said to him, Permit it to be so now, that thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he allowed him. When he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were open to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending upon him, like a dove and alighting upon him. And suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And so at first we see John the Baptist, who is the herald or the one that was proclaiming Christ, the forerunner to Christ, uh, baptizing. And now Jesus comes to be baptized. And at first John objects. Why would he object? Because John's baptism was a baptism of confession of sin and repentance, right? And so he's saying, wait a minute. Um, why should I baptize you when I am really what? The sinner. Uh, I am the sinful one, John is saying. Remember, John also says that I must decrease and Jesus must increase. He also says that he's not worthy to even untie his sandals. And so Jesus says, no, we are to permit this so that for this time for me to be baptized because it fulfills all righteousness. You notice that permit it to be so now for this is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. And then he allowed him. And, um, we know that Jesus' baptism sets the example for all future believers. Okay, and so this is the beginning of his ministry. Even Jesus, who is sinless, becomes baptized. And we also, we of course know from Scripture that Jesus never sinned. Hebrews 4.15, just to remind us, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without what? Sin. So we have a sinless Savior, all right? However, Jesus died in the place of men and was showing that he was going to be in their place. His baptism represented an identity with sinful men, even though he was not sinful. He's perfect. He is the God-man, 100% God, 100% man. Baptism identified with sinful men. And we're reminded of 2 Corinthians 5.21, who is one of the one of the important verses in Scripture that really just define the gospel, and it says this about Jesus and the Father doing this to Jesus. He says, For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So at this baptism, we, we notice that there is approval of Jesus' baptism. Very important. Once he baptizes Christ, uh, that is John the Baptist, the Savior, the Holy Spirit, de de descends like a dove upon Jesus. The Holy Spirit was anointing him, saying uh, that he is anointing his ministry. And as Jesus is fully human, he is fully um, obedient to the Holy Spirit all the way through his work. Remember, even when he is brought into the, into the wilderness in chapter 4, it tells us, in Matthew 4, that the Holy Spirit led him into the wilderness. And when we see his miracles of healings and all of his different miracles, it is the Holy Spirit that does those things. And we also see the Father's good pleasure in his baptism. For him. So from that time, Jesus is led by the Holy Spirit and the Father speaks. And this is one of the few times in all of Scripture. And what does he say? This is my beloved Son in whom I am what? Well pleased, right? And um, it's interesting, Israel in the Old Testament had circumcision, circumcision, 
and identified being a Jew with circumcision. Do you remember um, Abraham was circumcised, and if you became a Jew, you had to become circumcised if you were a male. So in the New Covenant, in the New Testament, Jesus, um, we see that there is baptism. And that doesn't mean they equal the same thing, because Israel and the church are different. So in the New Testament, um, there are over a thousand commands. Did you know that there's a thousand, over a thousand imperatives that we are to follow in the New Testament? And if you were to ask me all thousand, I don't know all thousand, but they're in there, right? And they're in the Greek, and they're, they're imperatives. And what is interesting is at the end of Jesus' life, when he gives the Great Commission, after he is resurrected from the dead, he tells the disciples to obey all that he has commanded. Uh, you guys are familiar with the end of Matthew. He says, do all that I have commanded you. And if you were to look at Matthew, you would find just in Matthew alone that there's over 160 imperatives in Matthew, right? So you were to go in the Greek and look through it. And, he, and so they are to do all these imperatives. However, in all those commands, he specifically mentions baptism. Isn't that interesting? He, he says to obey all of his teachings and to be baptized. And I want you to look here at the end of Matthew. We looked at the beginning of Matthew where Jesus is baptized. Now we're looking at the end of Matthew where Jesus commands the disciples as they go out and people proclaim uh, faith in Christ and Christ alone, by faith alone, he commands them to be baptized. And listen to this in Matthew 28, 16 through 20. It says, The eleven disciples went away into Galilee to the mountain which Jesus had appointed for them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. It's really encouraging because um, all authority is from God, right? And he's given him this authority to go proclaim this, right? And he says, he says, go, there's a verb, right? Go, therefore, and do what? Make disciples of all the nations. And then here you go, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. So he says, go, make disciples. And um, baptize them and teaching them all that I've commanded you, all the imperatives in Matthew and also all the imperatives in the New Testament. Now, I want to say that the word baptize actually means to immerse. That's why we believe in full immersion baptism, because the word actually means to immerse. Um, you can tell your Presbyterian friends that that's what the word means. And... Um, Matthew says you are to be baptized, uh, not in your own baptism, but a baptism that is in the name of the triune God. Uh, notice that this is actually a verse that shows the triune God, right? In the name. Name is singular, right? And yet you have three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So the Christian is saying, I am identifying myself as a follower of the one true God. And um, you notice that there are already disciples, but a disciple, somebody who is regenerated, has new life, in obedience is going to say what? I want to identify publicly to the world that I am a follower of Jesus Christ. I also want to identify to the church that is meaning that I am part of the fellowship, Right? So really in John 17, Jesus prays that the elect would be one with, with uh, Jesus and the Father. And of course, that is through the Holy Spirit's work, because we find that in John 16. And we see that the Holy Spirit comes, and the Holy Spirit is what regenerates people. But baptism shows outwardly that you are part of God's family. And obviously, water never changes a heart, just like circumcision in the Old Testament never changed a heart. Matter of fact, Jesus, uh, not Jesus, but uh, Paul makes this clear about circumcision in, in Romans 2, 29. He says this, but he who, he is a Jew who is one inwardly and circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit, not in the law, whose praise is not for men, but from God. And so uh, what I want you to understand is baptism is not, the water doesn't have some special effect 
uh, that saves people because if that was the case, I would want to lay, would want to line up all of Plain City, all of North Ogden, and, and just dunk everybody, right? Right? Wouldn't that be wonderful if we could do that? But that's not what happens. And actually, we see many people who defected that had been water baptized, right? And in the Old Testament, we have people that have been circumcised and they what? They defect. And so baptism shows what happened in your heart in faith alone in Christ alone, okay? And it represents that I'm a true follower of God, specifically identifying with Christ. I, I think that the great verse for this is uh, Galatians 2.20, one of my favorite verses. I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life which I live now in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And what's interesting is if you were to, um, after you get through the gospel accounts, if you were to go into Acts, you would find that as soon as people are saved, um, they follow what Jesus told them to do and told the disciples to do, and that is they get baptized. Over and over in the early church in Acts, you saw the people get baptized immediately after they were they believed. And here's some of the verses. I just put them up. You can look at them later. Acts 238, 231-812, 813-836, 838-918-1047-48, 11-16, 16-15, 16-15. 33, 18, 8. So you have all these verses that show they get saved and when somebody's saved, they want to be obedient to the Lord because they love him. And part of that is being baptized because they're identifying that they have new life, that they've been changed, that they're a follower of Christ. Now I want you to kind of think about this. Imagine how hostile the Jewish world would have been um, for you to tell the Jewish world you no longer are a Jew but a Christian because we, we find that the first people who heard the gospel were Jewish people, right? Acts 2, it was Pentecost. And the first 12 chapters of Acts really focus on the church in Jerusalem and Judea. And as these people are coming to faith in Christ, they're publicly saying, I am no longer a follower of your world system, this Judaistic worldview that it wasn't even biblical in the first place, but I am a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so you could imagine as you make this public statement to the unbelieving world and, and to other Christians, um, uh, you're going to run into some troubles, right? And, and I believe today in America that sometimes uh, baptism has been trivial, trivialized uh, people have made it more about the person. Really, it's about Christ. It's about being a Christ follower than it is about um, just having a special baptism for this one person. Look how wonderful they are. No, it is to proclaim what Christ did in them. And they're telling everybody, I'm following Christ. I am no longer, actually, it is no longer I who live, but what? Christ who lives within me. It's saying, I'm no longer Casey Ballard. I am Christian, Right? I'm a Christ follower, or whoever it would be. Um, your identity has changed from yourself to identity in Christ. That doesn't mean we're perfect, but it means our identity's changed. And, and really, they have kids do it today, and a lot of kids, and I'm not saying the kids can't be saved. Uh, there's little kids that are saved, but some of the kids don't even know what they're doing. They just do what the parents tell them to do. And so... Um, sometimes it don't require true confessions. And I want you to understand that water baptism is really about the glory of who? The glory of God. Very important. Uh, scripture teaches us everything we do should be about the glory of God. And you're giving glory to God when you're baptized and not to yourself. And you're glorifying God in your obedience to do it. You're proclaiming to others that God has forgiven you, not through the baptism, but through the cross and through faith in him. You're telling the world that you're a new creation in Christ. You have a new citizenship in Christ. You're saying, I am part of the body of Christ. And, and I just want to say this. There is no chapter in the Bible that deals specifically with baptism. Um, we have a faith chapter in chapter 11 in Hebrews. If, if you were just to go to chapter 11 in Hebrews, it would be all about faith. If you were to go to 1 Corinthians 15, which we went to a few weeks ago, it was all about the resurrection. 
If you were to go to um, 1 Corinthians 13, it's the love chapter, right? All about love, what is love, what it is not. So what I decided to do is, is look at Romans 6, because I think Romans 6, we're just going to look at it quickly, but Romans 6 kind of shows us a picture of, it's not particularly just about, it's not about baptism, but it's about dead to sin and alive to God. And, and part of coming, going into the water and coming up is representative of your new life. You were dead in your sins, and now you have union with Christ, and you're what? You're raised with him. Uh, do you see what I'm saying? It's a picture of that. So we're going to jump into Romans, Romans 6 for a moment and get a couple principles here. Um, if you'll turn over to Romans 4 first to kind of get a little bit of a historical context, and I, I just want you to know, if you're interested in this Romans 6 and how it contrasts um, with baptism, uh, Danny Aiken has wrote a wonderful article on that. If you're like, hey, I want to really understand Romans 6 and get more information on on baptism and stuff, and so I took a few of his ideas, but... Um, it would be a good article to read. I can get that for you. But look over here to Romans chapter 4. Um, now notice that um, chapter 4 clearly tells us that a man is declared righteous by God through faith. Um, notice that he says this, For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? And this is, of course, quoted from Genesis 15, 6. Abraham believed in God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. So he found his righteousness by what? Believing in God. It wasn't through his works, right? Romans 5, 1 says this. Therefore, having been justified by faith, by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And what we find in Romans 5 is there's an identity is the man of life. The man of life. And uh, if you're familiar with this chapter, there's two people in this chapter. There's Adam, the, the perfect man uh, in the perfect environment um, with the perfect genes. Uh, some of you have better genes than me, but Adam had better genes than what? All of us, right? And the perfect man in the perfect environment fails miserably, right? And the perfect man in the unperfect environment conquers everything, the Lord Jesus Christ, right? And so really when you have this passage, you see the identity is the man of life. Paul contrasts Adam and, and Christ. And listen to what Romans 5.12 says. Therefore, just as through one man, that is Adam... Sin entered the world, and Adam's sin uh, entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men because all sinned. And so sin entered the human race through Adam. And we call this, if you want to look it up, called original sin, right? We call this original sin. And that is, um, unfortunately, all my offspring are sinful, and all their offspring are going to be sinful, and it goes down and down. And, and, and the problem is, is we're all what? Sinners, right? We're all born children of Adam, right? So death spreads to all men. All men became sinners. And Adam's sin brought judgment on all of us because there is not one person that I know in here in 100 years well, with the exception of maybe somebody really young, 120 years, they won't die unless, of course, we have the rapture, right? Um, but in saying that, the curse went from generation to generation, right? Now, however, um, we also have spiritual death, not just physical death. However, through Christ's death, all can be made right with God and all can have a life. And in Romans 5, 18 and 20, it says, Therefore, as through one man's offense, that's Adam, judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation. 
Even so, through one man's righteous act, the free gift came to all men, resulting in the justification of life. Read on here. For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners, so also by one man's obedience, many will be made righteous. And notice that's a play on words. That doesn't mean that some people escape original sin. It's just a play on the words in the Greek language. Verse 20. Moreover, the law entered that the, that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. So the identity goes from Adam to Christ for the believer. Everybody's born a child of Adam, right? I feel like C.S. Lewis and the Lion and Witch and <laughs> right? But everybody's born a son of Adam, but if they believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, they can become a son of God. They can become a person that has new life, right? Jesus said, I am the truth, the life, right? So the identity comes from Adam to Christ. So baptism testifies of this new identity. Um, it's saying to the world, I've been changed. I'm no longer a, a son of Adam. I'm, I'm no longer, um, the scripture puts it, a, a child of the devil. Instead, I've been adopted through faith, and now I'm a child of God, and I want to proclaim it to the world. And so cir circumcision was to show that Israel was a nation, I think baptism is deeper and is to say, I have a new identity that is in Christ. And so in looking at this, Romans 6 kind of tells us um, this identity. Um, and one of the things um, in this identity is you no longer want to delight in sin. As a Christian, you're saying, you know, I lived a life of sin. I was a slave of sin. Now I'm a slave of God. It doesn't mean that I don't sin, but it means that I no longer want to delight in sin. I want to delight in my Lord. And listen to Romans 6, 1 through 2. It says, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? And, and I want to say this. To the non-believing world, uh, they look at Christianity and say, well, that person, especially here in Utah, that person became a Christian because he likes the idea that he's forgiven and then he can do anything he wants to do after he's forgiven. Right? But I have news for those people. The thing is, is God has changed your heart and your desires. So you're not just trying to put on an outward shell. Instead, something happened inside the person so that they're a new creation and they're saying, the Holy Spirit lives in me. I think differently. I just don't really enjoy sinning like I used to. Whenever I sin, God disciplines me, and it's just not as enjoyable. It's like you start doing it, and you go, oh, man, that, that, that used to be enjoyable. Uh, I used to watch this movie, and I really enjoyed it. Now I watch this movie, and I just can't enjoy it like I used to. Well, why? Because the Holy Spirit's changed your heart, right? And so for the Christian, it makes sense that that when you're saved by grace through faith, your works flow from a changed heart, right? It doesn't flow from, well, I got to do works because I got to make myself right with God. No, he made you right, right? Through faith. So you no longer want to delight in sin. He says, he's like, I think it's Meganet. Uh, I forget how to say it in the Greek, but he's like, it's like, an, it's like certainly not. Like, no, no way would we ever do this. How shall we who died to sin live any longer? How would we continue to carry on the life that God saved us from? Or how would we continue to carry on the life that is no longer us? We're a new creation in Christ. So you sin, but it is not your desire to practice it. You were dead to your life in Adam, and now you're in a new life with Christ. Also, uh, this verse, the next verse, baptism testifies that Christ died in our place. Uh, notice that he, he says this in, in Romans 6, 3. Or do you not know that as many of us were baptized into Christ Jesus, were baptized into his death? We were immersed into his death. We were baptized. So when you're being baptized, you're saying, he died for my sins. 
Uh, he didn't die for some of my sins. He died for all my sins. And I'm a sinner. And, and, and I put my faith in him because he's the perfect sacrifice. He's God's lamb. He's the perfect lamb of God. And as I put my faith in him, I'm saying, there's nothing in me. He's my substitute. He's the one that's righteous. He's the one that's holy. He's the one that obeyed God perfectly. And he's the one that satisfies God's righteous wrath. And by believing that, you're believing he did that in your place. So by, baptism testifies also of identification with Christ's resurrected life. Look at verse 4. He says this. Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we shall also, also should we walk in the newness of life. Isn't that amazing? Uh, when somebody comes born again, their thinking, their desires change, and this is newness of life. And you try to talk to an unredeemed person, they just look at you and go, oh, hmm, that's strange. Because they don't understand it, because it's what? It happened internally. So when you're submerged into the water, you are showing your death to sin and your union with Christ and his death and your union with the new man, the man of life. Jesus is raised from the dead and you also are. Look at verse 5, what he says here. So if, or if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection, Right? And um, the old man is dead. Look at verses 6 and 7 here. It says, Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the, the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin. You still sin, but you're no longer a slave to sin. I want you to understand that. We sin every day, but we're no longer slaves of sin, right? The unbeliever does what he wants to do and decides to sin all the time because he's a slave of sin. You also see your life will never end. Uh, you are a, forever a Christian forgiven by God. Um, grace, you know, in the Old Testament over and over it says, your mercy endures for what? Forever. And you just kind of start thinking about that. You go, man, he's not going to judge me for what I deserve right now, and he's not going to judge me in the future and what? In eternity. And so his mercy endures forever. And also his grace is not just for this life, but his grace is forever, right? That's why we're going to sing to him in heaven forever and ever. So for the Christian, a, a, forever a Christian is forgiven by God. Look at Romans 6, 8 through 10. Now if we've died with Christ, we believe that we shall also what? Live with him. And he's up um, creating, uh, well, I mean, in, in the mansions or whatever, uh, preparing a place for us. And, um, and we're going to be with him one day. Look at verse 9. Knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies more, no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. Isn't that amazing? But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Now notice also... Um, this one might be kind of one that we don't think about a lot of times. Your baptism is a daily reminder to fight the flesh. Um, because you're identifying with Christ, you, you have to remind yourself, what am I? A Christian. And what does a Christian do? He represents Christ. He submits to God, right? So your baptism is a daily reminder to fight for the flesh. Look at verses 11 through 14. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. So here he talks about sanctification. He says, therefore do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey in its lust. And do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead, and your members and instruments of righteousness to God, for sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. So, there's some things to think about there. You can go home and read over Romans 6. I think there's an application here of baptism. I'm not saying that the chapter is 
uh, speaking about baptism, but you see this uh, correlation. Now, before I ask them to come up here and give their testimony, each one of them, I want to say this. I think Charles Spurgeon uh, really identifies uh, baptism well, and I want to go ahead and put up this quote from Charles Spurgeon. Um, are we cheering for Charles Spurgeon? All right. All right. So, um, so it says this, what connection has the baptism with faith? I think it has just this. Baptism is a vowel. A, a, a vowel, I think is how you say it. This means an open declaration of faith. The man was Christ's soldier, but now in Christ he puts on the regimentals. This means his uniform, uniforms of the regiment. The man believed in Christ, but his faith remained between God and his own soul. Here he goes. In baptism, he says to the baptizer, I believe in Jesus Christ. He says to the church, I unite with you as a believer in the common truths of Christianity. He says to the onlooker, whatever you may do as for me, I will serve the Lord. It is the vowel of his faith. Baptism is also to the believer a testimony of his faith. He does in baptism tell the world what he believes about tells the world what he believes. I am about, say he, to be buried in water. I believe that the Son of God was metaphorically baptized in suffering. I believe he was literally dead and buried. To rise out of the water sets forth to all men that he believes in the resurrection of Christ. And um, today we have three people that are going to make a declaration of faith. And they're identifying with Christ. And they are saying, I'm part of Christ's church. And he called me to himself. And they're telling the unbeliever, unbelieving world that they are Christians. And so what I'm going to have to do is, um, Rocio, I'm going to ask you to come first. And then uh, Christy, and then Enrique, you'll be last. Um, and what I'm going to do is, after they give their testimony, uh, we will go outside and um, I have some chairs for uh, the people that are older or need a place to... Uh, the people who are uh, more mature in their lives as they grow. <laughs> uh, some people that need to, to sit down. Um, we have some seats out there. There's only a few. And so I, I want to make sure that we um, accommodate some people. Um, but each one will give up, come up and give their testimony. And then um, Victor's going to help me uh, baptize Rocio. And then Michael, I'm going to use Michael's strong muscles um, to help me pull up Enrique, right? All right. So um, it's because Enrique's tough, strong guy. So um, I don't know if I need to tell you all that. <laughs> but it's already been said. So All right. So Rocio, come on up and give your testimony. Uh, of the Lord, but before you do, I, I want to pray for you and for Enrique and for uh, Christy. Lord, I just pray for these um, these souls. Uh, Lord, I pray for these um, three individuals um, that were sheep that were lost um, that you found, and and Lord, I just pray you get all the glory today. I pray that you'd help them to speak. Lord, I've already heard their testimonies and. Lord, I, I pray that you would help them to speak well and be able to communicate well and give glory to you. And uh, we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, hi. I don't know if you can hear me. <laughs> but um, my name is Rocio, and I choose a verse that really crossed my heart. Um, and I choose John 3, um, 5, 6, where it says, Truly, truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. The flesh gives flesh, but the Spirit gives spirit. Um, that I read several times that verse, and it really shocked me. Um, years ago, but 
I didn't, I was not saved at that time, but I know God was calling me. And the other bird said, lately, I, for the last months I have in my, in my thoughts is Romans 12, 17, where it says, don't reply anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what's right in the eyes of everyone. Um, I used to love um, get even with people. Um, and since lately I have read more the Bible and I have a year almost ha uh, coming to this church, I came because I give up. I was doing my own thing. And this is what I write about my testimony. I didn't want to make it long, but I kind of do it a specific. So a year ago, I was in a really hard situation. And I really did. God really convicted on my sin. I couldn't see nobody's sin, just mine. And I never experienced that before. I couldn't make myself a victim. And I started to see my husband and people differently. And I repent of my sin. Now I just want to be obedient to Jesus Christ, my Savior and Lord. So that's my my testimony, and that's the verse that I want to share with you. Thank you. Okay, um, I'm kind of nervous. <laughs> um, I guess I should kind of start from, in a sense, like the beginning. So my parents, they were not born here. They were from uh, Laos. And the the people in Laos, or I guess in a sense, like my native language, we are Hmong. And so I grew up uh, learning that language, um, Speaking, I can't speak it as good as I used to, but we, I grew up in a Christian home. Um, we went to a, a church. It was a small church and it was taught, um, a lot of the teaching and a lot of the, the hymns that we sang and stuff. It was all in my native language, Hmong. And, um, you know, you're, I was young and I heard the gospel, but it never really, it never really, um, like changed me. I never rejected it. I never, never not believed it, but I never professed and I never, it never changed my heart. And then when I turned, I want to say 12, I decided that I wanted to get baptized, um, not knowing what it really meant. And it, it's just like what Pastor Casey said, where it's like you do it because it's either your parents say so. And in my case, it was, you know, yeah, I wanted to do it because I wanted to be obedient, but I didn't know anything about um, re repentance or profession of faith. I knew nothing. And so, and my parents, you know, they, they were just, they, they were glad to do it. And so we had a uh, a pastor from California who is also uh, Hmong, and he came down to visit us. And he took us, and he, it was me and, and two others of my cousins, and he baptized us. And, you know, after we were baptized, they were really happy, and I was happy, and they, they were like, oh, you know, you're, you're one in Christ now, you, you and Christ are one, and, you know, I was excited, and, um, but like I said, I just didn't know what that meant, and so, I kind of just went on living my life, um, never changing, living the way I wanted to, never thinking twice about what baptism meant, what, what that really meant and not being taught, never even opening the Bible to read scripture to even understand what that, what that meant. 
And so I just kind of grew up and was living in, going my own direction, living in my own sins, um, and never looking back, never thinking twice about God. Um, and then fast forward, you know, I got married and was just still living the way I was living, doing what I was doing, you know, living in sin. And and then one day, I honestly can't really, I think it was probably like three, four months ago, I just was just kind of sitting on the couch and all of a sudden I just started having this like urge to want to go back to church because we had been in COVID and I hadn't been, you know, to church. And all of a sudden I just... I just had this urge that I wanted to go back to church. I missed the I missed being in church, even though a lot of times I didn't really I wasn't living like a Christian or I didn't really understand what was being taught, but I still wanted to go back to church and so I started just searching online for churches. And I don't even remember how it happened, <laughs> but I like stumbled across uh, a sermon by John MacArthur. And I just figured, and the sermon was called Saved or Self-Deceived. And I was like, you know what, I'll just click on it, just to be curious. And so I clicked on it. And he started with the verse, uh, I think it's Matthew 7, where it says, uh, on that day, many will come and say, Lord, Lord. And he will say, depart from me, I never knew you. <sighs> and... My whole life, I've heard that verse many times, here and there, um, but it never struck me the way that that it struck me that day. And I don't know. And I just kept listening to what he was saying, and everything he was saying, it described who I was. I wasn't a Christian. I had no fellowship with God. I had nothing. And I knew in that moment that if I died, I would go straight to hell. And so I got on my knees and I, I prayed. And I begged for forgiveness and I begged for mercy. And I, I submitted my life to Christ. Um, and even after that, like, I still didn't, I was still really confused and I was still really like, I was super hungry for truth because I was still grasping and I had, I still knew, knew so little. And I, you know, I started listening to the Bible and <laughs> I didn't know where to start. So I started, you know, just in the beginning and I was, every day I was trying to listen and try to understand. And I started looking for church, churches to go to. And I went to the first church I went to and their sermons were good. But I still felt this overwhelming, like, hunger for for truth. Just so much hunger and, like, the desire to know truth and to, to feel, um, just to feel secure. And so I went to that church, and, and then I went to another church, and their sermons are also really well well thought out, and their scriptures were well, their teachings were good, but just just that hunger just would not would not like go away. And so one day I was just you know on the Grace to You website, and I found that they had um, a, a counseling line, and I called and I asked. I spoke to them for a while about how I was feeling, and they um, they directed me to to this church. Um, and I called, <laughs> I called Pastor Casey and I was kind of an anxious, not kind of, but I was an anxious mess. And, um, and that's how I, I ended up here. And I still have a lot to, I still have a lot to learn. I still have a lot to understand and to battle. But now I know that my heart has been changed. So, Yeah. Um, 
Well, I was a, uh, what's it called? Catholic when I was uh, younger and did all that Holy Communion and everything. And uh, when I was in my early, early 20s, I got in trouble. And uh, so I went to, well, I got in trouble, went to jail. And some guy came up to me and, and told me, start reading your Bible. So I started reading it. And I read it. And uh, and the one I the verse I like was Matthew um, six forty four. No one can come to me unless to me unless the Father who sent me draws him to me, and I will raise him up at the last day. And uh, so. <laughs> So I just uh, kept reading and reading, and over the years, and uh, I did. Uh, when I was in that cell, I asked Christ in my heart, and uh, and uh, I became a believer. And uh, and the other verse I like is two Galatians two twenty, and it says, "I have been crucified with Christ." It is no longer I who lives, but Christ lives in me. And, and, the life, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And no, no. So I'm not that same person I used to be, and now I'm just a, a believer in Christ.